Firstly, my apologies. I'm a couple of minutes late, but I'm very pleased with Mrs. Parvanova, my colleague. I'm very pleased that she is jointly chairing this meeting, looking at what is a highly important subject, the question of scientific assessment. Now, we have been talking about this a lot here. We've talked about it for several months. But my first words will be to say that we need a, an independent, reliable uh, agency for assessment. It's critical for the decisions that we have to take, decisions that we take as representatives of, of European citizens, and also the decisions to be taken by the Commission and the Council within their respective remits. This assessment has to be credible, transparent, and first and foremost, independent. To illustrate this point, I'd like to go back to Besvenor A briefly. The 27th of September, so just a month ago, the French Food, Environment, Labour and Health Agency published a report on Besvenor A. And I think it's fair to say that it uh, was at loggerheads with EFSA's view on this. There was a suspicion of adverse effects on the human body, on fertility, uh, female fertility, cardiovascular difficulties, and diabetes type 2. In laboratory animals, there was a... Uh, there was uh, evidence of lesions on the mammary glands and an impact on female poverty. Also, uh, it's worth saying that uh, early puberty is a growing problem in Europe. That's what we've seen in France. And this can happen at dosage levels that are much below the benchmark doses. And that the, the daily acceptable intake cannot be considered as adequate protection today. So that's the French agency's view based on a number of studies. On the contrary, in its September 2010 opinion, EFSA considered that there was no scientific evidence suggesting a need to alter the threshold. The difference between the opinions comes from where then? I think it does, it's quite striking. Well, the fact is that the French agency looked at all the studies, even where, it, it, even where experiment, experimental protocols were not in line with good laboratory practice, which is what we're going to discuss today. The good practice, good laboratory practice, are an important outside the agencies. The majority of ex experts feel that these standardized tests are outmoded and are not able uh, to pick up on, uh, on disruptions caused, for example, by endocrines. It's important to make sure that these tests are not used to disregard certain scientific discoveries. The first uh, studies go back uh, to 1997, looking at the impact, the adverse impact of these on rodents. And it's taken uh, us over 15 years for, to, take us, to take measures on this. Let me remind you about BSE, let me remind you about MediaCore, let me remind you about asbestos. Why is there such a disconnect between academic study and the majority of health agencies? Why is it that assessment agencies seem to be so susceptible to industrial uh, arguments? On the 12th of October seminar organized by EFSA on independent assessments, Debates focused on the question of conflicts of interest, especially among experts sitting on panels. As such, it's difficult for us to really understand 
that EFSA doesn't understand that members of its uh, panels belonging to, for example, the Institute of Life Science could represent a conflict of interest. The logic appears to be that it doesn't make sense to disregard industry's assessments. Okay, but at the same time, it, 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 it's argued that it's impossible to get scientists that haven't worked for industry because they're the best in the field. That may be true, and if we do need to enter into a dialogue with industry. But at the same time, when these are public health decisions, you need a clear split between industry and the agencies that are assessing product safety. As multiple scandals have demonstrated in the past, it would be naive to believe that high quality assessment can, believe, can be based primarily on industrial, uh, industry-led uh, research. There are two options. Either you guarantee independence or, and you wipe out any possibility of conflicts of interest. And here it's rather difficult to believe that in the European continent it is hard to find 20-odd scientists of the, of the best quality that don't have a conflict of interest. Or, and this is another avenue that I would expose, we explore. You organize assessments in a contradictory way, if you like. In other words, you listen to experts working in industry as well as experts working purely in the academic world. So you have a scientific debate, and it, then you have neutral scientists that take the decision. We need, if we focus purely on quality and disregard independence, this could be a smokescreen. Independence could perhaps should perhaps be the linchpin of a public agency like EFSA. So I'm pleased that EFSA is rethinking independence, even if, uh, as things stand, we're far from in the right position. At, at the moment, we're seeing this of a problem with political influence than we are with economic influence. The problem here is that we don't have a clear criteria which mean that the agency is not susceptible to outside arguments from industry. Now our speakers will look at specific cases today and I welcome them but we're not looking at the hazards represented by any given substance. It's about trying to think about specific solutions that we can put in place. Legislative institutional solutions so that we can factor in all the academic literature, even if we are to disregard it if necessary, but at least having taken note of what's out there. To wrap up, perhaps I could just say uh, a bit on the question of how you build in doubt. On the 29th of October in its editorial, Le Monde in France said that the shortcomings in certain agencies have led to the creation of a new discipline. Agnotology, they called it in Le Monde. It's essentially a science which is designed to study the way in which a society uh, looks at how you break down knowledge. The technique's always the same. When there are alert signals coming out of the scientific society, industry bankroll studies, which don't have any effect, and which are all about creating doubt, creating question marks over adverse effects, meaning that there is controversy about the very existence of adverse effects, meaning that there's a need to conduct further research before regulating, therefore gaining time, and then gaining more and more time over, over the, the course of the scandal. It's particularly worrying. In the case of health scandals, we need to make sure that academic literature has its rightful place at the heart of decision making, and that's the goal today. So I'd like to thank all stakeholders who've come along today. EFSA first and foremost, thank you for agreeing to be part of the debate. The debate will be open, maybe critical, but I would like to thank you for being so open. Uh, and I would like to thank you for being part of today's discussion. So I welcome you. I'd also like to welcome the Commission, although sadly today the Commission will be purely an observer. As a risk manager, the Commission plays a critical role. You can't see risk assessment and risk management as two totally different 
fields where there is no overlap. No one could think that. The Commission also is responsible for the relevance and credibility of assessment methods. As such, the Commission has a central role to play in the debate. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I wasn't too lengthy in my introduction, and I'll give the floor to my friend and colleague, Mrs. Pavanova. Thank you, Corinne. First of all, I would like to thank everybody for coming here, because our objective here is to listen to everybody and to have the point of view of everybody who is interested. Uh, we are decision makers, and uh, we know very well that it's crucially important for Europe to have an independent body to help us to decide in the process of regulation or uh, legislation making. We know that we need EFSA, we need uh, EMA, we need all the European Union agencies, but we have to trust these agencies and we have to be absolutely confident that we can trust them, which means that there is a high level of transparency, uh, transparency and responsibility. Why? because we ourselves are exposed to a very high level of trust from the public. And if we do not serve according to this trust, it means that we are actually not delivering to what the public is expecting to protect their interests. Some of us are doctors, but not all of us are doctors or chemists or biologists. That's why we should have a reliable expertise. And we have to be absolutely sure. So that's why all the examples that my colleague Corinne Lepage has presented to you are vitally important for the way that the Parliament is perceiving the expertise and the role of EFSA and the other agencies. There have been some very compromising events and messages and information brought forward by NGOs and the media, which are quite worrying. And that's why we would like to be absolutely sure that in the future we won't be put into the process when we have to regret and we have to go back in our decision-making process and to overlook and again to go through all our decisions which might be based on biased scientific research, and especially research which is paid by industry, but not necessarily disclosing the full truth or the full data of that research. Furthermore, independent scientific bodies, which are funded with public money, are also fighting for their point of view. We don't want to make a clash between these different studies and different uh, understanding of scientific research, but we have to rely and we have to make sure that our agencies and this house here, we have all point of views and we are able to take independent decision. We are also consistent on this and we have and we should have the same approach towards not only the experts in one agency, but the experts in the agency should obey the same rules as we require as parliamentarians from ourselves and also from our commissioners, for example, or high level officials in the European Commission. What do I mean? Here in this house, we have proposed set of guidelines and requirements for former commissioners, what kind of role they could have actually in the future, what kind of positions they could take and whether they are able or not to work in certain fields and for certain companies for which they have, for example, been responsible in their capacity of commissioners. It is the same, actually, requirement for MEPs, which means if we have for such a high level of officials these requirements, there is no problem, actually, to apply these requirements also to the experts of our agencies, because all of us, we are driven by one main principle, to keep Europe a successful project, to protect our citizens, the health of our citizens, and our environment. So if we could do that, then it means that we should find the possible tools, even anticipating better financial portfolio, for example, from Horizon 2020, to sponsor the independent public scientific research that will actually enable us to take <coughs> decisions 
in which are with better quality. So by saying that, uh, I would like to wish success to our seminar. And uh, it should be a common sense, actually, what we will be here debating and concluding. But if we came to this stage, it means that definitely there is a room for a little bit of discussion. And finally, to confirm something that I said it's a common sense that we have to be honest, transparent, and responsible. Thank you, and success to everybody. You can. Alors, je passe donc la parole. First of all, I'll give the floor to Dr. Fiorella Bel Fiorella Bel Poggi who's director of the Cesare Maltoni Cancer Research Centre, dealing with a burning subject for us very often, aspartame, and the fungicide, mancozeb, as examples rising in terms of studies not taken account of in the assessment. I'll give you the floor for 15 minutes. You have the floor for a quart d'heure, madame. Merci bien. Merci, madame. Thank you uh, to Madame Lepage and to Madame Parvanova for uh, inviting me. I'm very, very pleased to be here and to bring in some experience to you of 40 years of work in cancer research. I will present my data in English also. If it is not so a good English, I ask you to forgive me. But uh, um, uh, the scientific language is English, uh, is an English privilege, and so I prefer to speak in English. Um, this is the Castle of Bentivoglio, where the laboratory of the Ramazzini Institute is located. The Ramazzini Institute is uh, a, a, an independent, no-profit organization. It's a social cooperative with more than 22,000 active associates. We are uh, working in cancer research with uh, two laboratories. One titled to Cesare Maltoni, our founder and mentor, who is a, uh, which is performing uh, long-term biopsy with the uh, scientific protocol which are chosen on the basis of the end point we are trying to 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 give in, a, in to put in evidence uh, and we have also from 2010 um, a new laboratory in the same facility named the European Experimental Laboratory, which is GLP certified and in which we perform experiments following the OECD guidelines. So we have both the experience, independent research, auto-sponsored research, and sponsored research for a um, rich purpose or, in any case, for registration of drugs or chemicals. Uh, our aims are, among others, not only this of research, but also to train speci specialized staff to circulate information on environmental and work-related cancer risk and to set up clinical programs. We have also a clinical facility in which we perform early di diagnosis. But I am here as a scientist. I am not here as an opinionist. And so I decided to bring here my knowledge about the mechanism of cancer, what is the basis of cancer, what is the relation of cancer with age and other factors. So I show you these slides in which uh, you can see that cancer, the, the onset of cancer, is related to age, to the individual susceptibility, to the exposure to agents which has some particular carcinogenic effect, 
but also age at start of the exposure and the duration of the exposure are very important factors. We have not to forget that children are not small adults. They respond to the uh, uh, environmental uh, pollution in a very much sensitive way. In fact, uh, if I can use this metaphor, I can say that susceptibility, as in the tale of the three little pigs, is the house, the building of our body. And this building can be straw building, wood building, or a stone building. So if we consider the toxic agent as wolf, you understand very well what is individual susceptibility. If our DNA is the straw one, we can have very low exposure, but to, to become sick for different disease, not only for cancer, now we call uh, this uh, kind of diseases as environmental diseases. And so if it is in wood, this will happen later during our life. But there is also some old man who is smoking from 40 years and doesn't get any lung cancer. So this is the basis to understand uh, individual susceptibility and carcinogenicity. What we can do? We can do something about against exposure, but we can do nothing at all with aging or uh, su individual susceptibility. So as legislators, what you can do is just to take a low level, the maximum lowest level of exposure. What is doing our Cancer Research Center? As I told you, we are in a castle and we have two kinds of laboratory. One certified, which perform industrial research, and another one, which perform what we call social research, because our citizens who ask us to perform this kind of research, which perform fundraising, which perform the uh, condition to to do it. For example, electromagnetic field from 50 Earth uh, um, electricity, or artificial sweeteners, or other kind of pollutants or agents which are, which are every day in our lifestyle, are studied in our Cancer Resource Center for social research. But what is the difference? So it is the same fertility. We have two laboratory, one with white labels, another one with yellow labels. This is the impact of the difference when you enter our laboratory. The real only difference we have is the protocol. The protocol, which can be a prenatal exposure of uh, individuals, of rats, for the major part of our experiment, and continuing the exposure or the observation for all the lifespan. This why? Because we think that we have to reproduce as much as possible the human counterpart to have a human equivalent model. If we use an artificial model, we are surely losing a lot of information. And I would like to demonstrate you all that. What is this human equivalent model? As I told you, we use uh, Spragdoli rats as our preferred model. But why? Because we had the occasion in the year 2001, when we celebrated uh, in a congress at the New York Academy of Sciences in New York, our mentor, Cesare Maltoni, to honor him, I tried to demonstrate that there is a correspondence between humans and rats as regards the onset of malignant tumor. And what I, fo I, find, I found at that time, more than 1,000 people 
uh, with the malignant tumor compared to, to more of 1,000 rats with malignant tumor. If we look at to the distribution of tumors, this is the curve. We compare 16 weeks of age of animals to 10 years of humans, and as you can see, the distribution by age was very, very similar. If you do the same with the cumulative prevalence, that is astonishing. So you have a model in our colony of rats which reproduce very well the human counterpart. But as we don't kill humans at 55 in order to perform a good biostatistical study, I think, we think in our laboratory that you have not to kill animals when they are still alive for the two-thirds of all the group of animals you have studied. This is the rationale of the choice. It's not a choice which can uh, have other reasonable um, uh, um, things on the basis. This is the basis. But you can see from this graph that we were reason because the line the line you see is 104 weeks, two years of age. If uh, we truncated the experiment on vinyl chloride after two years, we have never demonstrated that the vinyl chloride was carcinogenic at, at 25 ppm. All the risk assessment on vinyl chloride was performed in Europe and United States on the basis of our study. And the reason was this one, and again angiosarcomas, and again for benzene, and again for xilins, which is a wonderful example, because the National Toxicology Program studied it, truncated at two years of age. The study was negative. If we killed our animal after two years, our study too could be negative, but it was uh, uh, positive and uh, there was an increase statistically significant. So I think that this lifespan study is a more sensitive way to study. The same for the thyroid tumor of, of uh, Mancozeb, as you can see, they were not statistically significant as increase. We have seen it after two years. In fact, the panel of experts of uh, the President Obama in their document wrote, lifetime toxicity studies provide an alternative approach to better answer questions about early exposure and latent effects. But what about prenatal exposure? Again, with vinyl chloride, look, the red line is the breeders, the, other, the yellow are the offsprings, the same dose, at the same time, in the same laboratory, such a different response. So this is what I know, and I am here to tell you what we independent scientists know. Again, look to the blue line. Do you see it? Only 15 weeks of exposure versus uh, 76 weeks, six weeks in adult, we had a, a response which was, how many times? 10 times more than in the adult one. So ethyl alcohol, the same. Benzene, the same. Aspartame, the same. When we studied the lower dose, 2,400 ppm, in, uh, in, with the prenatal exposure, we found a statistically significant increase of lymphoma, instead of a negative result we had in, uh, performing uh, the exposure on adults. So GLP, OECD protocols, guidelines are not an hallmark of scientific reliability. This must be very clear from the scientific point of view. This is the key point. This is the key point. 
So, confidentiality. I would like, if I have the time, to touch this point because a lot of time we are, were accused to be reluctant to make our data available. Yes, we were sometimes reluctant because we received scientists from all over the world with a microscope to ask to look at our slide. Why? If we, as we do, sponsor our study at the Ramazzini Institute with public money and with the money of citizens, why have, I, have we to show our data to industry coming just to criticize? No. But we are very open and we tell to everyone, EFSA knows, and TP knows, in fact, we have a, a huge agreement with the National Toxicology Program in the States. We have a very, very fruitful collaboration, but agency, not private. We finance with the public and we have to be open to the public. So at present, in the framework of a general agreement with NHS in the USA, which allowed us to survive to the tremendous attacks we have had after the aspartame study and other study, they helped us to survive. After a pathology working group they had in the last uh, April, uh, no, in 2010, they wrote, the Ramazzini Institute was found to be a well-organized, clean facility, including animal rooms, necropsy room, histology laboratory, and archives. The Ramazzini Institute staff appeared to apply meticulous detail to necropsy recording, collecting, archiving of material tissues from their studies. The same methods, and this is very important, have been consistently applied over the decades 40 years of activity, providing an ability to compare studies over the time. This is consistency. This is consistency. When the GLP were approved in the 70s in the United States, at the moment we were performing the, the vinyl chloride study and the Food and Drug Administration visited our laboratory multiple times. We worked with the industry. Mobile Oil Corporation, ExxonMobil, which now criticize so much our work, were our sponsor for more than 10 years. So what you must have in mind, and I finish with the staff of my institute, re uh, remember Children are not small adults, and we are not killed in order to perform a good epidemiological study. So as our long-term biases are epidemiological studies on an animal model, I recommend to study these animals at least for 130 weeks which correspond to 70, 75 years in a human. This is the good way to expose all the risks which are linked to a, a specific compound. Thank you very much, and excuse me to be some longer. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, We've heard you out because we were extremely interested in what you said, and I think it helps us all. But I'll now give the floor to jo Dr. John Fagan. Dr. Fagan, who's the director of Earth Open Source in London. I'll give you the floor for 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, parliamentarian. Le micro n'est pas mis, monsieur. Thank you very much, um, uh, Parliamentarian Lepage and Parliamentarian Parvanova, for this opportunity to uh, speak to, to this group today. We are very much appreciative of this. It's a very important thing that you've brought together. Uh, we 
um, want to get right down to the point here. And uh, the basic, um, if we could have the next slide, please. Uh, the basic principle that we're talking about here is the, um, the issue of interest, industry science versus independent science. Um, these two seem to have diverged. Next slide, please. Um, and it's interesting that they often have conflicting views with respect to products that are being reviewed for their safety. Uh, industry typically concludes that these products are safe, uh, whereas um, independent science often uncovers harm. Uh, the next slide, please. This provides an example. In the case of bisphenol, um, uh, if you look at the literature as a whole in vivo studies, there, there are in total something like 115. 94 of those were by independent scientists. And they all, uh, they all concluded, or the vast majority, um, concluded that there were negative problems with this chemical. There were four industry studies. All of them concluded that BPA was safe. Now, the question that we're puzzled with is why is it that EFSA um, based its assessment only on the four industry studies and concluded that this is safe when there's a vast um, literature uh, that's really pointing to the hazards of this chemical. It's a very big concern. And if we ask, what are the criteria that um, uh, are being used by uh, EFSA and by uh, the commission in general in assessing these things? This is not limited to BPA, bisphenol A. We see the same thing with uh, pesticides, and we'll talk about glyphosate a little bit more. We've done recently uh, a paper that really brought scientists together from around the world, pointing out the problems with the assessment of glyphosate. Um, genetically modified foods, same situation. Food additives, um, uh, my colleague here um, really raised the issue of aspartame. They've also worked on mancozeb, uh, a fungicide. The same story with all of these and many others. These are just uh, um, uh, prominent examples. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a problem because the same party benefits that profits. Mostly we're seeing that EFSA is focusing on industry, accepting the industry studies. Those studies are put together and commissioned by the, the organizations that will profit from a positive review by EFSA. It's not a balanced and safe situation. Um, and it does matter because research shows there have been a number of studies uh, really gathering from the literature showing that independent studies are much more likely to find risk, much less uh, uh, likely that industry studies will find, uh, find risk, but generally find safety. Again, you look horizontally and you see the situation with tobacco, with chemicals, GM foods, medical products, drugs, mobile phones, the whole range. Now, we're not saying that uh, this is the case with every assessment that's done, but this is a general issue that needs to be considered and to be corrected. Um, why do regulators reject independent studies? They give four basic reasons. The first is, well, there's not enough detail in independent studies to allow evaluation of those studies. They say there's lack of access to the raw data. They say, well, these studies are not done according to GLP, good laboratory practices. Um, and they say, well, they're not done according to the OECD um, compliant standardized methods. So let's look at these arguments and see what the real situation is. Now, when you talk about the peer-reviewed scientific data, you're looking, you're talking, you're criticizing the, the foundations of the scientific um, endeavor. You're criticizing what, what is, when you, when you reject that data, you're really rejecting five, six, 
hundred years of scientific tradition, a methodology that has been designed to bring forward, bring out of uh, the discourse accurate, reliable information. And um, that's clearly something that uh, it's really questionable whether it should be, um, uh, it should be questioned. And it's clear also that with peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers as we see them today, that um, sufficient, in order for a paper to be accepted, there must be sufficient detail uh, provided to the reviewers of that paper to assure that the paper is uh, capable, uh, has sufficient detail that it be replicated, that you could replicate it. The basic principle that we all as scientists, uh, students of science are given by our professors as we uh, be, aspire to become professors ourselves is that when you write a paper, you must put in the methodology and in the description of the results sufficient evidence to so that anybody who reads that paper can actually replicate it. That's the standard by which we all operate. So that first argument doesn't hold water. And then the second argument is the, uh, is, uh, the availability of the raw data. The first principle is that when you publish a paper, sufficient data should be presented so that it's complete in itself. The second is that if a paper is criticized, if a scientist is challenged uh, as to what they've published, they are obligated to provide additional evidence. And there are many examples of going right back to the laboratory notebooks and having, having those reviewed. So it is within the structure of our peer-reviewed scientific system that the data is available on that level. So we can, and, and, and on the other side, it should be pointed out that industry studies are not always accessible. Um, with GM foods, at least here in Europe, the public can access the data um, that is used by EFSA. Uh, with pesticides, it's the experience of many of the nonprofits and many um, private individuals who have tried to obtain the information that there's this big shield that's set up that says confidential because of uh, this is confidential business information. There's commercial confidential confidentiality that is cited as being uh, the reason that the data is not available to the public. So in many cases, it's been necessary, both with pesticides and with GMOs, to take the issue to the courts in order to get data to really review things uh, carefully. And then there's a third thing, which is that typically risk assessors are so pressed for time that they don't even look at raw data. Typically, it's a digested summary of the results of studies truly a digested, congest, uh, condensed study that is provided to the risk assessors by the industry at that time. And often that, that um, digested summary is much, much scant on data compared to what you would find in a peer-reviewed scientific study. So it's just not the case. And so going back to our slide, uh, yes, there is plenty of detail available in the independent studies. And yes, there is access to the raw data. So now let's consider the whole issue of um, good laboratory practices and the OECD standardized protocols. Good laboratory practices. Industry and regulators claim that industry studies are reliable because they are done according to good laboratory practices. But what does GLP mean? Uh, GLP is a laboratory management system. It's, a, it's a, a formula for how you do your standard operating procedures in the, in, in the laboratory. And it was initially put forward uh, in order to combat uh, very rampant, uh, nothing, you can't call it anything other than fraud in industry research that was being done uh, back in the 70s and before. Uh, 
And so it was really brought in to at least have some kind of an antidote to that. But it really doesn't focus on the science. It's not a hallmark of good science, but of just some better practices in terms of how the um, documentation is done, how things are recorded, how the procedures are done in a superficial way. But it does not in any way assess the validity of the experimental design. It does not assess the suitability of the measurements that are done. And it doesn't assess the, the sensitivity of the tests that are being done. So you can do a GLP compliant study, and it can be literally meaningless because it uses outmoded, insensitive, ineffective approaches. And this is often the case. How do you find that a, um, a chemical is harmless? You use methods that are incapable of detecting the harm that is there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, no, this one is the right one. So um, the so you could say that GLP is really industry's shield. It was set up to prevent, prevent industry fraud, but in fact it's being used as a shield by industry to reject uh, independent science because it's not GLP and operates. Uh, and, and, but in fact, what I'd like to emphasize is that the independent scientific methodology, the approach that's being used there, is actually more rigorous and more carefully criticized and evaluated than what is done with GLP. Peer-reviewed studies, the procedures must meet the adva most advanced uh, standards to be competitive. Um, documentation must be um, very complete. And the peer review process really looks at the valid validity, the suitability, the sensitivity in a very careful way. So GLP should not be used to, next slide please, GLP should not be used to reject independent science, whether, it's, whether GLP is used or not. Now what about these OECD procedures? The Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. This is an organization whose focus is on economic cooperation and development. Its focus is on getting products into the market smoothly around the world. Its focus is not on rigorous science. It's on how to get things commercialized. It is not appropriate for such an organization to ch challenge the um, standards of the scientific community. It's simply not appropriate. They're not capable of doing that appropriately. Independent science is done by varying protocols because those protocols are designed for the specific chemical that is being evaluated. You cannot expect that a single standardized approach is going to work with every chemical. You have to design it specifically for that particular question. And so this idea of these standardized approaches is very convenient if your purpose is economic development, but it's not effective if you're moving forward with, um, if you're trying to find the scientific basis of what's going on. Next slide, please. Standardized tests, um, often their design is out of date. Often they ignore vulnerable developmental windows. There are points in the development of, an, of, of a child, of a, a fetus, where they are hypersensitive to specific chemicals. If, they're, if, the, if the mother is hit with those chemicals at that time, it could be minute amounts that could cause problems very seriously. That isn't even, even assessed in these things. They ignore the most advanced scientific uh, insights as well. So there are many other shortcomings that it could take a whole afternoon to really go through those things. So we're very concerned about this. And the conclusion is that all four of the reasons that regulators use for rejecting independent studies do not hold a, a, a drop of water. They should be themselves rejected as not being based on real science. They're based on OECD science. They're based on the convenience of commercialization of products. 
Um, so there's really no reason to favor industry science over uh, regular science, of, of real science, we might say. So um, in the light of this, this really came to, the, came to the light, became very clear to the European Parliament and to the Council as well. And out of that has come this new pesticide regulation that requires peer-reviewed science to be taken into account. But then EFSA came to the rescue of industry. They essentially came out with guidance that opened up huge loophole, uh, loopholes that allowed industry to reject independent science again. They said, well, the guidance was, well, you could say, you industry, you can say, well, they used the wrong animal model in that independent research, or they used the wrong exposure route, or it wasn't relevant because it used, uh, it did not use OECD standardized approaches, and it's not reliable because it's not GLP. So they come right back to these arguments that I think we've already put to bed. But just to remember, um, uh, if you uh, going back to that guidance, one of the big points that they make in it is that um, it's basis EFSA policy on a Clemish paper for what is reliable science. Now the authors of this are all members, are all employees of BASF, chemical industry. And it says only GLP is reliable, and non-GLP studies must be taken with a great deal of distrust. Now, if you look at the, um, uh, if you uh, the criticism of using the Clemish report as the basis, uh, EFSA's response was, well, we look at things other than Clemish. But in fact, if you look at the papers they cite, there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you see that they're largely derivative of the Clemish work, and all of the papers they cite reinforce the idea that reliability requires conformity to OECD and GLP standards, which just does not make sense scientifically. Um, next slide, please. So we conclude Clemish does not represent the, the consensus on what reliable science is. And the conclusion is that the EFSA is not justified in judging reliability of studies based on the Clemish criteria. Next slide, please. The bottom line in all of this is that by relying on Clemish and by following the EFSA's new guidance on the new regulation, they've created a perfect loophole to ignore important independent peer-reviewed science. This is a big gift to industry. It's a big threat to society. It's a big threat to the children and grandchildren of every person in this room. Uh, next slide, please. Um, EFSA keeps using these same old bad arguments. Uh, somewhere in their guidance, they say that yes, um, GLP should not be considered as a guarantee of reliability, but they come back to complaining that independent studies do not use GLP and that they, um, they simply are lacking in background information. But we've emphasized, we provided evidence here that in fact that information is available. Uh, e EFSA finally tries to, in their guidance, to reject independent science altogether. Quote, reliability appraisal for non-GLP studies may be more difficult than for G uh, GLP studies. And so essentially, they're opening the door for industry and regulators to take the easy path and ignore independent studies. So these are all still being, I, you know, I could go on for, uh, on this uh, more. Next slide, please. But the problem is, is that independent study, an independent science is still under risk of being ignored. Uh, the science, the real science, is being robbed of its ability to signal to regulators and to the people that there is risk with certain chemicals. The pesticide industry ends up as the victor in this and the public its victims. Um, 
I think that we now should go to um, uh, Claire Robinson, who will really point out what we feel are the solutions to this situation. There needs to be a change, and I think she can really outline the key elements of that. Okay, Madame Robinson, you. vous avez la parole. Si vous pouvez essayer de garder votre temps. Mrs. Robinson, you have the floor. If you can stick to your speaking time, please, given that we have a lot of people interested and a lot of speakers. And to industry testing its own products. Industry should pay money for tests into a central fund administered by government, and government must commission independent labs to do the testing. Next slide. Solution two, include independent science in the risk assessment. Regulators must include all competent peer-reviewed independent studies in the risk assessment, and they must publish rigorous scientific reasons for rejecting any study from the risk assessment. Solution three, update the required tests. Redesign the standard tests that pesticides and chemicals have to go through so that they reflect up-to-date scientific knowledge. In law, OECD member countries have to accept OECD tests, but we understand that the EU can designate other testing regimes as valid. Solution four, rewrite the EFSA guidance, arrange for independent scientists and legal experts to rewrite the EFSA guidance and the SANCO draft data requirements to fulfill the, the intent of the new pesticide regulation. That is, that independent science is fully taken into account in risk assessments. Solution five, introduce transparency. End the close and secretive relationship between industry and regulators in risk assessment. Open up the process from the very beginning to the scrutiny of independent scientists and the public. Solution six, avert the legal threat from industry. Overhaul risk assessment. Involve independent scientists and legal experts. Close the industry-friendly loopholes and put in place a firm legal basis for protecting public health. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Ça avait le mérite de la... Thank you. That was extremely brief and very, very helpful as a set of proposals. So thank you. And I can throw the floor open now. If I can suggest giving the floor to Per Berkman. Is Per Berkman here? So, Mr. Beckman, if you would like to come back on things as you want, and then we'll continue with the debate. But I'd like Mrs. McGlaid from the Environment Agency to comment afterwards. Mr. Beckman, you have the floor. Thank you, Madame Lepage. And thank you for inviting me um, to this important event. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm glad to discuss EFSA's independence. Uh, this is um, another event during this, this hectic autumn where we discuss our event. EFSA, in, in, EFSA organized an event a couple of weeks ago where several uh, speakers actually are, are here um, as well. So I'm glad to see you again. Um, we are um, situated in Parma, in northern Italy. We were created by the European Parliament and the Council uh, to protect food and feed safety after a series of uh, food scandals. And the risk managers wisely separated risk assessment from risk management at that point. So we do not have any risk managers in Parma at least within EFSA. What the risk managers very wisely did was also to write um, a good founding regulation for EFSA. May I have the next slide? Where the founding regulation 178-2002 in Article 22 clarifies that EFSA shall carry out its task in conditions which enable it to serve as a point of reference by virtue of its independence. So it's really very well underlined that we shall work to stay independent 
and of course all accusations today that we are working for industry and not for the consumers, uh, I would uh, not agree, of course. I'm, however, quite sad to hear it, that this is the view. Um, and I hope to be able to explain to you that our intent is to work for the public. Next slide, please. In Article 27, the founding regulation describes that experts shall annually declare, um, uh, submit a declaration of commitment and a declaration of interest, indicating either the absence of any interests which might be considered producer to their independence or any direct or direct interest that might be considered to influence their independence. And this shall be done also before each meeting as is normal. EFSA has taken this, this guidance from the regulators quite far. Uh, and as we have heard from auditors, we have, they have difficulties finding a comparator uh, who is working at the same level. Uh, next slide, please. The management board of EFSA has uh, in, instituted a cy cycle of learn and change, where the principles of the founding regulation were transformed into a DOI policy. Um, it is now being recast into uh, an independence policy during 2011, which we believe is more in line with the actual intent by the, the, the fa founding fathers and mothers. Uh, rules and procedures uh, and guidance documents have been created and have been updated. We have a unique IT tool for declaration of interest um, handling, and this is now being updated uh, also to, to make it basically impossible to attend a meeting as an invited expert without having a uh, specific an or an annual declaration of interest approved. I will get back to you shortly on what this actually means. We've had numerous audit reports uh, telling us that we are on the right track with very little non-compliance. Um, and now, of course, we have the European Court of Auditors benchmarking exercise, which is very important for us, where four agencies are being compared, ECA, EFSA, EMA and European Aviation Safety Authority. Next slide, please. So the state of play regarding our last, si last cycle here is that um, the management board adopted a reflection paper in May. Um, the draft policy was um, endorsed by the management board during the summer, we had a public consultation, which is a global event. Basically, we publish it for anyone to comment. Uh, during the end of the summer, beginning of the autumn, a consultative event where we invited those who had commented, importantly, to speak, to explain, to elaborate their points. The board will discuss um, the outcome of, of this um, during the autumn and amend and, uh, and adopt a, a new independence policy in December. Next slide, please. The policy itself ap applies to members of the scientific committee, the panels, the working groups, and other EFSA experts, the management board, the advisory forum, which are appointed national experts, and the executive director, as well as the EFSA staff. Please remember that the EFSA staff are not included in the founder regulation as um, a group that should declare their interests, yet we do so for transparency internally. Now, what is the working context of this policy? Um, just to make it uh, short, um, we, have, we, we work in, in, in the context of adopting opinions and communicating this science. Uh, we do that after have, we have recept, received a, a request, and the assessment is done by scientific panel or working groups, and the adoption as well, while the publication and the communication is done by EFSA. Next slide, please. So how do we ensure pluralism in the scientific debate in our working groups and in our panels? How do we ensure that? We need pluralism, and we need all views to be heard. Within the working groups and the scientific panels, we need to have a composition of, of members 
that is is adequate, that is suitable and represents the views. So we do invite hearing experts to broaden this. Um, we do uh, ensure that member states experts are invited at different points uh, during the assessment if they're not part of the work themselves and if there are um, there's a, a risk for diverging opinions between us and a member state risk assessment body we do um, put into effect article 30.2 of our founding regulation which um, uh, stipulates that we have a special responsibility to be vigilant in this respect and to meet and try to f to to f map out the differences and try to reach an understanding if possible we also have public consultations and hearings and we do not allow ourselves to work in a, in a silo we work in a european context now the next two slides are kind of important it shows how we work with annual declarations of interest. An annual declaration of interest within EFSA is a prerequisite to join a working group. So the chair uh, would propose someone to be part of a working group, and EFSA would ask that person to, to uh, submit an annual declaration of interest, and we screen the, the interests that are declared if there, are a, if there is or if there not is a general conflict of interest vis-a-vis -vis the task of the working mm -hmm. group. And if there is, there will be a rejection. If there is not, the, the person can join the working group. Um, but there might, may be notes, and this is not visible. Uh, there, there may be uh, notes in the database specifying that, that the expert cannot deal with this or that because there is a potential conflict of interest vis-a-vis -vis some of the things that have been declared. But it will be visible in the minutes of the meeting, because in the next slide, when the person is a member of the working group, he cannot join the working group work unless there is a specific declaration of interest where the agenda items themselves are compared with the annual declaration of interest. And the agenda items might vary. There might be different substances, for example from different companies. This means that if there has been a contact with a specific company at a specific point, the expert may very well be excluded from those agenda items. So if a conflict is identified, there might be a decision for no participation or partial participation. If it's not uh, a, a large overlap of interest, the might, person might be able to be heard, even though might not be part of the drafting. Next slide, please. So what interests are declared? Well, our, our, it's not rocket science. It, it, it's really the, what you all would, uh, I think, agree. Um, ownership and other investments, including shares, is important. Uh, also, previously important, if you are a member of a managing structure or, or equivalent, your employment or your consultancy are also very important. These four points, point one, four, one, two, four, and five are if they are if there is a current engagement which is judged to be a, a p potential conflict of interest, it might be grounds for exclusion, meaning non actually not being invited to be a member of the working group even. Point three and then six through ten are also very important, but a past interest might not be judged as harshly. And we have a five-year period for which the experts must declare their, exp their, their, their interests. So how do we work? Next slide, please. And I'm so Madame, I'm soon finished. Um, the declaration of interests, um, and this triangle, as we call it, uh, the triangle of, of declarations of interest assessment is used both when you join a group or before uh, a meeting where you would take a look at the interest, what is declared on this line, the shares, for example. Okay, you have shares. Fair enough, many people have shares. What's the mandate of this working group? Is there a link between the mandate and the shares? And, and uh, you would also ask, is, what is 
what is the role of this expert in the working group? And would, would it be possible to downgrade the role of the expert and therefore make it possible to hear the expert? For example, could the expert be a hearing expert? Or does he have to leave the, the room? My last slide. Declarations of interests during 2011, up to now, we have screened 1,650 um, annual declaration of interests. They are annually resubmitted. So we have a continuous cycle of resubmissions from our experts. 24 conflicts of interests were identified, meaning that the expert were, was excluded from all further work with EFSA. These were general conflicts of interests, meaning that it's not compatible with work for EFSA at all. However, those that were, did pass the ADY level, they might have potential conflicts of interest vis-a-vis -vis certain agenda items. So we screen before each meeting. Next, uh, and, and there you have 3,431 different meetings have been screened. Over 30,000 agenda items in total. And, and this, has, this has resulted in just over 250 potential conflicts of interests being prevented by the expert, for example, leaving the room and therefore not taking part in the drafting. And this is mentioned in the meetings always, sorry, in the meeting minutes always, so that it's transparent and, and easy to, to see who was in the meeting and who was not. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take questions after. Mrs. McClay, please. Um, Madam Chairs, I wanted just to uh, intervene at this point because, uh, as some of you may know, the agency, uh, the European Environment Agency, also deals with a tremendous amount of independent evidence, independent advice coming through science. But very specifically for this particular debate, we have over the past uh, 15 years been working on a project known as Late Lessons from Early Warnings. And so many of the topics that I think you have before you, um, including bisphenol A, but also some of the long-known items, mercury, lead, asbestos, and now, more recently, mobile telephones, um, have really come under our kind of, uh, onto our working table. And one of the things that I, I felt very strongly about uh, needing to intervene on was that that experience has taught us, uh, I think, one or two very important lessons. And that is that having realized that there are, of course, potentially vested interests from industry, we recognize that there are also vested interests from scientists. Scientists have paradigms, in fact, which they become very strongly wedded to. And I must admit that the experience of the climate change debate has genuinely, I think, exposed precisely that. And what we have um, undertaken in the last two years are a number of workshops behind closed doors to encourage those who, having in principle undertaken fundamentally solid research and investigations and analyses, working to the very best of their potential, have actually come out with diametrically opposite conclusions. So we looked at uh, spraying of pesticides, we looked at bisphenol A, and one or two others. And we found it intriguing that having got highly illustrious scientists together, uh, and authoritative bodies, agencies, chief scientists, and many others, that they could have come to such completely different conclusions. And we wanted to know why. What it turns out for us is that it's something to do with the burden of evidence. It is the way that evidence is put together. And it's about a fundamental misunderstanding sometimes of the latency of some of the phenomena that we are dealing with. In other words, if you set up a longitudinal study, and I'll use mobile telephones as an example, we would not expect to see cancers appearing for quite a long period of time. So there is no point, in fact, bringing evidence forward after five years, after eight years, if the latency is something in the order of 10, maybe 15 years. But the first study that turns up, round about 10, 15 years, that shows even small evidence should be a warning signal. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that looking across the scientific literature on these very, very well-documented areas, tobacco use, etc., 
we discovered another phenomenon, which is the perils of the precy. In other words, if you don't do your work well, you may find yourself using just the abstracts of scientific literature and not really leading back into the content of the papers itself. Now, this sounds like a totally trivial thing, but I have to say that the evidence lies before us, which is that even in, in Digi Sanko sometimes, their overarching report, the summary report, does not actually reflect the true domain of the, of the data and the analysis. And I'm particularly concerned about uncertainty. So what we've learned from climate change, and I'll use that in a kind of neutral way, is that first of all, avoid, well, um, do not use early warning scientists at your peril. In other words, people who detect the very early signals who are somehow put outside of the paradigm of the mainstream quite often should be listened to very carefully. Secondly, do not necessarily adopt uh, a view that the current paradigm doesn't come with it uh, large vested interests, both in the academic world as well as in the industrial world. Uh, thirdly, I think that the burden of evidence and the precautionary principle and the level of uncertainty has now, I think, a global um, acknowledged criterion set in the climate change documentation. So there we can actually see after many, many years of acrimonious debate, a kind of set of criteria for likelihood and probability, which I think actually helps a lot of this debate get onto paper and for people to position themselves where they are on the risk assessment business of whether something is uncertain, unlikely, or probable. So I think there's something we could use there in the European debate. And then finally, um, I, I just want to just reflect a little bit, because in the last three days, the agency has brought out a number of reports. This morning we launched the Air Quality in Europe report. Tomorrow we bring the transport report through and we talk about resource efficiency and so on. And, and all I can say is that today we see that 90% of the European population in urban areas is exposed to levels of exceedance for PM10. Uh, as far as heavy metals are concerned, 12% are overexposed for lead, 54% for mercury, for ozone, 55 to 80%, depending on which urban areas, and for sulfur dioxide, somewhere between 68 and 85%. So all I'm saying to you is that the backdrop of low-dose long exposure in the human population is already there, and perhaps one thing that the Parliament and all of us should reflect upon is every time something new enters into our kind of setting, it's not as if it's coming against a completely blank sheet of paper. And I think it's this cumulative effect that from our side, we would welcome a kind of larger debate of the additive nature of what we're actually endeavoring to do. And when do we start to take things out of the system as opposed to continuing to add things? So I just put that on the table more as a sort of precautionary note, not that we have any of the answers at all. Thank you. Merci, Madame Mag Thank you, Mrs. Magled. Before I throw the floor open, I think we too have one or two questions to put to Mr. Berkman. Firstly, listening to you, Director, I'm wondering why the European Agency is bearing in mind independent studies, whereas EFSA apparently doesn't, you know I'm asking that. Secondly, of course I listen carefully to what Mr. Berkman and Mrs. Parvanova has a question about this as well. My question is I'm a little frustrated not to have an answer about the choice of study. You didn't comment there about the choice of study, that's very important and that does affect our discussion. Mrs. Pavanova. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, I will read actually uh, a table that we have received as MEPs from different NGOs, most of them represented here. And this table has been discussed during uh, our uh, meeting at uh, ENVI committee. Uh, I'll read it actually without comments and you'll have your own uh, probably uh, comments on this. Uh, it is about conflict of interest, Mr. Bagman. Uh, I can give you the table, I'm sure you already have it, but anyway, just in case. 
uh, having the fact that you presented a perfect bureaucratic administrative procedure to check all the uh, conflict of interest or possible conflict of interest, still we have the following data. 24th of March 2010, Susie Rankins, GMO unit, head of the secretariat to the EFSA GMO panel, takes lobby's job at Syngenta, revolving door case, Technobiotech joint compliant. 29th of September 2010, Diana Banati, Management Board. EFSA Management Board, Chair Diana Banati, conflict of interest case with ELC Europe. This was reported by Jose Bouvet uh, in the European Parliament, and Banati resigns from the board of ELC Europe and was re elected chair of EFSA Management Board on 21st of October. 29th of November 2010, Laura Smilly, Risk Communication Unit. EU FIC reverse revolving door case, CEO report. CEO, Test Biotech, Food and Water Europe, Joint Compliant. 1st of December 2010, Harry Cooper, GMO Panel. EOC Conflict of Interest Case, again, Test Biotech Report. 23rd of February 2011, Milan Kovac, Matthias Horst, Judy Rüprich, Piet Van Temsche from the Management Board. Conflict of Interest of four Management Board members with Danone, EOC, EU FIC, and COPA. CEO report. 7th of April 2011, Angelo Moretto, Alan Budis, Theodoros Brock, PPR panel. Conflict of interest rife with Europe's pesticide and food safety regulators, report by, report by Earth Open Source, Claire Robinson of Jimmy Watch, GM Watch. 15th of June 2011, ANS panel. 11 out of 20 experts on panel on food additives have a conflict of interest as defined by the OECD. Four members of the panel have also failed to declare active collaborations with ELC Europe. 13th of August 2011, ANS panel, two experts, Ricardo Crebelli and Ursula gondert Raymond, failed to declare active collaborations with ELC Europe. This is actually the statistic, this is the quality of the procedure that you have presented, which means to me, and I don't think there is somebody else who will doubt in this uh, uh, room, that this quality, that this procedure is delivering is pretty poor. So that's why I think something should be done. And you have to convince us that this procedure is actually bringing transparency, and transparency instead of shadowing somehow or uh, uh, bringing uh, some un unclear and uncertainty, uncertainty to this transparency. And uh, uh, just to clarify, because there were some doubts and uh, it was unclear about the role and uh, uh, the background of EOC Europe. It is industry-driven think tank. And if you think that this is just a simple NGO which works with public money, we should probably clarify the background of this organization and how actually it has been financed and driven. But it's absolutely clear that it creates some conflict of interest, and I think this should be taken into consideration. Thank you. May I reply? Thank you. Je voulais juste dire, Monsieur Berman, vous n'êtes pas personnel. Just Mr. Berman, obviously we're not getting at you personally. We're very pleased that you've come to answer to us today. We're not accusing you of anything personally. I just wanted to be clear that this is not personally against you. It's not a very easy situation to cope with, and thank you for coming to comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. There are several problems with this list. Um, thank you for sharing it. Um, it's been... Um, circling several times. Um, we have answered different organizations um, on direct um, questions regarding these individuals earlier. Um, and actually, just today, we received a letter to, to EFSA regarding, I think, the whole list. And there will be an answer sent shortly regarding these persons. But there are several problems with this list. Um, the most fundamental one is that it's not the comparator is not the, the EFSA um, policy, but the OECD policy, and we are not OECD. So I would I would really urge um, because we have to follow our own policy. 
otherwise the auditors will not be particularly happy with us. The other problem, I think, is that, that the list contains three categories of names. There are panel members, and they are judged as panel members. And these panel members, they, have, they cannot have general conflicts of interest regarding the, 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 the documents on the table. They have to be assessed as panel members within the ANS panel, for example. There are also, and they will be assessed exactly like I, I described. Then we have uh, management board members mentioned, and that's a totally different type of, of group. We are not appointing the management board. The management board is appointed by the, the council upon proposals by the member states. And in reality, the management board uh, voluntarily follows the, the same um, policy as, as they have adopted, of course, the EFSA policy. But the consequence um, of a non-compliance with the, 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 the policy is, is totally different than for a panel member. A panel member, we can initiate a breach of trust um, procedure and eventually actually ask the person to leave. While in panel, uh, a management board uh, member, we cannot initiate a, a breach of trust. We have not appointed this person. The third category of persons who was mentioned in this list are staff members. And staff members are public servants who might or might not have previous interests for sure. And they all, all AD staff voluntarily are asked to, oh, sorry, EFSA has voluntarily started requiring that all staff fill in uh, annual declarations of interest at a yearly basis, certainly. Um, and if and this is then uh, assessed by the line manager and ultimately by the executive director upon instruction from, from the management board. And if there are conflicts of interest or potential conflicts of interest, depending on what's on the table of that particular person, what the tasks are, the person will be moved within the within EFSA or within the unit to tasks which will not generate a conflict of interest. And I can assure you, this is what is happening. I have done it myself as line manager within EFSA. Where so um, the, the, I hope this, um, to some extent, explains the, the context. And, and certainly, um, we, we did receive a, 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 the, the same list, actually, today, um, again, from one of the NGOs. Uh, and uh, the executive director will, will answer shortly. And what about the question of choice of study? Sorry to keep coming back on you about that. Uh, sorry. Apologies. <laughs> um, I have problems with this be because uh, it's not true. The, the, the submission guidance um, absolutely is not intended to exclude non-GLP studies. As the guidance says itself, non-GLP uh, studies are, are, are not the remedy for perfect studies. It's GLP is not perfect. In reality, in the so-called independent studies are not perfect either, always. Um, I, would, I, would, I would like to explain one point, though, uh, it was mentioned that um, the guidance mentions that GL, non-GLP studies might be di more difficult to assess. Well, that's true because they're not standard. Certainly, it would be more complex, but it should, it's not a reason to refrain from submitting such data. And I can assure you that the reason, that, sorry, the meaning of, of the, the panel of EFSA was not to exclude non-GLP studies. Merci. La question est à la salle. 
Thank you. I'll throw the floor open. Now, can you say who you are, please? My name is Nina Holland from Corporate Europe Observatory, and thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Paranova, uh, Paranova, or to uh, list all the uh, different examples of blatant conflicts of interest that have been uh, uh, highlighted. The only reason why uh, we used the definition of the OECD uh, in our report is simply because EFSA didn't have a definition of conflict of interest. You have a policy on declaration of interest, but you don't have clear criteria based on which to exclude people. And that is why in the GMO panel and the food additives panel, more than half of the people, you cannot say that they are independent. They have links, all kinds of links with industry. The vice chair of the food additives panel, her lab uh, in Wageningen University has been funded by Nestle since 2005. You know, how is that not a conflict of interest if you're judging all kinds of food additives? Which food additive is not of interest to Nestle? I mean, come on, just because Nestle didn't produce the food additive, like aspartame, it doesn't produce it, but it uses it in all kinds of products. So why is that not a conflict of interest? And EFSA doesn't deal with any of these complaints and in their letters to us, which are really not of very, uh, uh, well, they're all on our, our website and our responses to them as well. They really uh, cannot clarify this and they do not uh, take any action. And this new independence policy doesn't uh, offer any solution to the problems highlighted. Uh, for example, the European Medicines Agency has taken some action, for example, excluding people that have had any sort of business employment, uh, research funding from business or whatever, for the last five years. EFSA's response to that is, well, then there wouldn't be any experts left. Well, that is crazy. That is, first of all, it's not true. I don't think EFSA has any evidence for that. But second of all, well, <laughs> I think if, F is, if experts are not even paid for the work that they do and they're expected to work in holidays and weekends and, fr and uh, in their free time, I think there are many experts who can't afford or who work for universities who can't even afford or who can't do this. I think it's more likely to be uh, people with industry ties uh, that accept these kinds of posts because they can do it in their working time. Thank you. Perhaps we can take two or three questions. Would someone else like the floor to put a question? I'm working for Friends of Earth Europe. I have questions for, it, for you, the two hosts. Um, we just heard that EFSA drafted their own guidance document to implement parts of assessment of pesticides, which were defined in the new pesticides regulation. So I'm really wondering, I asked the same questions to different DGs, if it's really appropriate to our understanding for European democracy that a body who use or implement the rules should draft the law. Normally, we have a distinction where, where on one side we have decision makers, lawmakers, and on the other hand, we have people who apply laws. Yeah? So I'm really wondering if it's appropriate that EFSA drafts guidance, which are not part of a legal text, are drafted by staff of authority who intend to use it. and if it's really appropriate to continue in this way, or we shouldn't say they can draft something, and as long as it's not part of a regulation of a European directive, it can be considered, but it shouldn't redefine the meaning, for example, for pesticide regulation. And I'm just, Mr. Bergman, is it really, I know Nina Holland quite well, but could you please confirm that you don't have any definition for conflicts of interest? Uh, thank, thank you, Madam President. My name is Jim Murray. I uh, publish a blog on science and medicine called Open Medicine EU. Uh, I did, was once a consumer advocate working for Bayek. Uh, there's a lot that I have said, <laughs> could say here, about EFSA and uh, about the whole issue of conflict of interest and revolving door, not just in EFSA and other agencies in the Commission and in the Parliament. But I... I, I uh, I won't say that for a moment because I'm intrigued by the, the question of science and what's good science. And my blog is about what's good science. How can you ensure good science uh, when, for example, in medicine, a billion euros may be riding on the outcome of one experiment? Uh, I, I hope you'll look at it someday. 
but it's from that aspect that I really do have to put questions uh, uh, to, to Mr. Fagan, because um, he, he was arguing, it seemed to me, that there was some entity called independent science, and that was good, as against industry science that was bad, and peer-reviewed science that was good against industry science that was bad. I've never found myself, by the way, defending industry, let's be clear about this, but in medicine, peer review is the gold standard, but it's not all good. There are huge problems with it, and I hope uh, another time the group might hold a, 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 a hearing on how science is made in medicine and about peer review and all this whole process. It's, it happens to be my particular hobby horse. Uh, but uh, th there are big problems with it. There's a big problems about science is conducted in medicine um, and how it's funded and everything else. And that's really my question there to Mr. Fagan is this, how can we be ensured that the so-called independent science that he says is also good science? Um, the, the, uh, the, you know, the, we have to look at processes, we have to look at criteria, and so on and so forth. Peer review, the editors, uh, I'll finish, Madam President, the editors of three at least of the four biggest impact uh, medical journals, each in their own way, uh, Marcia, Richard Horton, uh, Smith, have each in their own way heavily criticised uh, peer review, while still supporting it. Let's be very clear about this. It still remains the thing to aspire to. But I, I just felt a bit uncomfortable when you were saying, we've got 111 uh, peer-reviewed independent studies ignored by EFSA, uh, and instead they just went for these four industry ones. Um, yeah. let, me, let me answer. Uh, and it's a criticism or a question well placed. You can only say so much in 15 minutes, and we couldn't cover the whole landscape of, of the scientific discourse during that period of time. But what I, I guess the core of my position is that the, it's interesting that the, uh, the, the name of your blog has the words open source in it. Open medicine, yes. Open medicine, and our organization is open source. The peer review process, the scientific discourse, the process that's been evolving over the last many centuries is really the first example, or one of the best, of open source systems, where you have transparency, you have dialogue that's contributed by any interested party, and because it's transparent, because it's open, the problems of conflict of interest ultimately resolve themselves. Oftentimes, they say in science, old theories don't go away. It's the people who have them that just die. And sometimes it's that way, that you have such powerful people within a discipline that it takes a long time for things to move. But it does ultimately create a body of knowledge that we can be confident of. And it's certainly in a, in a time frame of two years or five years or 15 years. There may still be big problems, but over time we have, we have the trust that this will resolve itself. But there are absolutely big problems in science as it is today. There are conflicts of interest. There have been big problems in medicine because there are big rewards for not being open. So I, I don't know, I'm, hopefully I've satisfied your point that I'm not saying the things I did with total naivete, but from the point of view of conscribed availability of time. Uh, okay, on the question about uh, the guidelines. Uh, it's so basic that it's already in the study books of uh, the universities. When I did my administrative uh, law studies, uh, the first thing that we learn is that those which are writing the guidelines and all kinds of uh, regulations are doing it for somebody else to apply it, but not those which are regulating themselves to issue also the guidelines. So it's so basic. That's why I think if it is in the student books, it's not necessary actually to comment. Uh, and it is the case, in, uh, as you said, in all other uh, commission and parliament and council bodies. In this particular case, probably, as you already mentioned, uh, Emma has 
reformed and did some steps forward, probably EFSA should follow and take the good practice from EMA and do some uh, coordination and collaboration uh, with them to know how to do it and uh, to um, avoid any further clash with public uh, opinion and public trust. Well, just to add to that point that I fully support, this subject is particularly worrying because of the way comitology operates for European Parliament members. We find comitology leaves a lot to be desired. MEPs have a lot of problems in intervening. Often we can give an opinion from time to time. The deadlines are all extremely hard to respect. So even if we have a small amount of power according to comitology, it's very hard to exercise that. So it's particularly important to have guidelines. And you're quite right to say that they shouldn't, they shouldn't be produced by the body applying it to themselves afterwards, whether EFSA or whoever. If guidelines are going to be so big, then in this guide you end up with some liberties being taken with a text which has legal force by Parliament and Council. So I think that's a very good point. Merci. Interesting discussion um, regarding regarding why um, the the answer to my question why OECD standards were, or the definition was used. Um, I would like to answer that um, the the EFSA definition of of what a conflict of interest is is found in the second paragraph of the the. the the management board decision from 19, um, to 2007. So, so it's 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 there. Um, it, however, that is not enough. A, a, a simple definition is, is is this is too complex to have a black or white answer. There are no simple um, solutions. In fact, we have found, as we are screening the 30,000 STOIs per year and, and close to 4,000 annual declarations per year, that life is very complex, and, and we have more than we have very many experts who have have different types of potential conflicts of interest. And EFSA is very wide. Within my directorate, we are dealing with 34 different legislative frameworks. And as, as and there are all sources to conflicts, post potential conflicts of interest relative to different types of interests. But what is one? Uh, what is a conflict of interest or a potential conflict of interest within one uh, regulation might not be so in another. So we have to think each time, and it takes a lot of time. I'm not complaining, not at all. I'm just saying it's not black or white. And therefore, we have two additional documents uh, published beside the policy. Um, one of them is called the guidelines. And within the guidelines, you will find a text describing how you can assess the different uh, um, interests declared in relation to the role of the expert and the task at hand, always. So there's no bl you know, blacklist of things that cannot be done by EFSA experts because we have too much of a complex environment with in-house. Uh, I, I would just like to give an example, which I'm, I'm not judging in any way, but our colleagues in Helsinki, they have one regulation to deal with. Within my directorate, which is a third of EFSA, it's 34 different regulations. So it's, a, it's complex and interesting, I can assure you. Now, the question regarding if EFSA should draft its own guidelines or not, this is an open question for the risk managers to decide, ultimately. We are tasked to do so. We are actually told to draft guidance as well as opinions on substances. However, in certain cases, the European Commission adopts or 
takes over our guidance, discusses with member states and makes commission regulations out of them. And then they are called implementing rules and we cannot. And, and of course, they have a legal, it's not soft law anymore then, of course, it's, it's actual le legislation. This does happen, for example, for GMO. So for the, the GMO food and feed uh, guidance now is in a very advanced stage of being transformed into implementing rules, or if you, you, if you want, um, a, a regulation. Uh, and the environmental risk assessment of GMOs as well. It's in the beginning of this phase where member states are now discussing on how to transform our guidance into a, a legislative framework. And we are happy to assist in this process. So, thank you. On va continuer, monsieur. And next round of questions, if we can take your question first of all, we'll put you on the list. Smilemon, I have a question for Mr. Bergman. If you can give a reaction to the presentation of uh, Mrs. Belporci, saying that the many of the studies, FSA is assessing, is missing the point, maybe, by not doing um, tests long enough and not doing prenatal tests. Um, that's the first point. And the second is, if EFSA ever invites critical scientists, if EFSA ever invites Ramazzini people or other people critical on Visional A to at least understand what they are saying. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur. Madam Chairman, thank you for the uh, thank you for the floor. Uh, my name is Eras Jones. I work for the European Crop Protection Industry, uh, Association, so for the pesticide uh, industry. And I, I'm looking at my watch, and uh, I see I'm the first person in nearly two hours from from the industry side to to actually be able to uh, to give a view with this uh, meeting. Maybe to, uh, if I can say it, to critically peer review the uh, the whole uh, the whole discussion. So I. I would like to take a, a few minutes to uh, to to comment on few, a few of the things that have been made, uh, that have been said, I should say. First of all, uh, I would like to agree with the point made by the uh, uh, by the lady from from Friends of the Earth. I think it is unfortunate, looking back, uh, that EFSA has been given this task of developing uh, this guidance uh, document. Uh, I think many of, this, many of the people in this room were actually involved in that discussion in the Parliament, and we have to remember it's a, it's a Council and Parliament regulation, and uh, this Parliament was part of that discussion. But I, I would totally agree with you. I think uh, it is probably uh, was not the best place to actually ask EFSA to develop that guidance document. But that's the situation we're in, and uh, I, I very much appreciate the point that was made by, uh, by Mr. Bergman that they, they have that obligation at the moment. I have to apologise for turning up a little late, but I did hear all of Mr. Fagan's uh, presentation, and I have to congratulate him on a very eloquent uh, presentation. I have to say, I think some of the arguments were very nicely spun as well. Um, and I think I'd like to pick up on the points that he made about the reasons to refuse the studies. And I think, I think you did try and, and leave us with a misconception um, you mentioned four examples. I've only taken down, uh, I only noted three of them. You actually said that many studies are, uh, are rejected because there's not enough detail. You seem to suggest that all studies are refused for that reason. But I think, let's be clear, the studies that are being refused for, for not having enough detail are the studies where there is not enough detail. It's not all studies that are being refused for that reason. I think that also applies to raw data. If the raw data is not available, then the study is rejected. I think that's uh, not a, an unreasonable uh, decision to take. You seem to suggest that all studies were rejected using that, uh, that argument. That's not the case. It's only rejected because of a lack of raw data when there is a clear lack of raw data. On the GLP issue, you're saying that studies are, are rejected because they're not GLP. I think we all would agree that studies should not be rejected just because they're not GLP. I think we all have 
a lot to benefit from having studies that go beyond GLP um, when they're peer-reviewed, when they are of an acceptable uh, standard. And I have to say, I, for one, am not qualified to, to make that decision. And I would suggest that many of us in the room are not qualified uh, to, to take that decision as to what is good quality, what is not uh, good quality. GLP in itself is not a guarantee of, um, of a good quality scientific result. I think we all have to accept that, um, that it's not just GLP that makes good science. There's many other elements that we have to, uh, that, that we have to take into account. On the solution that Claire Robinson uh, mentioned, I'd just like to pick up on a couple of the points that, uh, that were made there. One is, I think it's a very interesting concept, this whole concept of having all the studies being done by independent laboratories. I think there's a question of innovation, bringing new innovation, bringing better chemistry onto the market. What would the impact be on that new chemistry of having only independent laboratories doing the work? I put that as a question that I think we should all think about. But actually, if we go to the independent laboratory system, I'm sure there's many people in this room that in five years' time will be accusing those independent laboratories working for government of not being independent because they're being funded by industry. Not, maybe not directly, maybe indirectly, but I think that accusation will, uh, will come back and will hit us five years down the road because industry at the end of the day would still be funding those studies Industry would still be funding those laboratories, even if it is being funded indirectly. I think there's, there's plenty of cases today where industry is funding work indirectly, but where the accusation of uh, a lack of independence is being thrown at those, uh, at those laboratories. I think there's one thing that I find very unfortunate. Somebody said, I think Dr. Fagan, you mentioned, pesticide industry is the victor of this new guidance document from EFSA. We definitely don't see it like that. I think we are obliged to provide high quality studies. And I think what nobody has mentioned in this room, and that needs to be highlighted, there's an obligation on industry to provide a certain uh, type of study. It's set out in the guidance document. Yes, there's people that disagree with what's in that guidance document. But we have to be very clear that the pesticide legislation has always included within that framework that industry has to submit studies, but third parties are also given the opportunity to submit any study that they believe that is necessary. So please, if you see what we submit, if you feel that there are studies that we as industry have excluded from our submission, there is an opportunity for third parties to submit the studies that they believe that EFSA should be looking at. And I would invite you to submit those studies. If you feel that we as an industry are not doing it, then please, uh, please make sure that those studies are included in the review we do know that certain pesticides have been banned because of studies that have been submitted by third parties. It has been the case, and I, I hope that we will continue with a system where third parties will be able to submit their studies, and those studies will be taken into account. Thank you. Troisième prise de parole avant. I'll take a third speaker before I give the back. Is anyone here from the Commission? Would the Commission like to comment? We haven't heard everyone yet. No one from the Commission. Mr. Fagan then. I, I appreciate your comments. Uh, I didn't quite catch your name, but thank you. Um, let me follow up on your first point first, which is par third parties can provide uh, alternative studies. And I think the track record of recognition of those studies, whether you're looking at regulators here in Europe or in the US, is abysmal. 
that four papers on bisphenol, industry GLP studies versus 94 independent studies that were really not even really considered. This is what triggered the, um, you know, I think it was more than 30 uh, researchers around the world writing a paper that was, uh, sub, uh, that was um, published, uh, what, a year and a half, two years ago, objecting to the way that the bisphenol thing w was rolled out. And basically, it's true that uh, you can and the, can, and the EFSA can say, oh, yes, non-GLP studies um, are not rejected out of hand. But in fact, the track record is that non-GLP studies are not considered seriously by regulators, and, um, and this is encouraged by industry. Just look at the, at the bisphenol example. Look at what happens with GMOs. Look at what happened with, um, with any of these major controversial chemicals. There's it, the lack of GL, and now I'm touching on your point about GLP. Your, the lack of use of GLP in those uh, independent studies is often used as an argument for rejecting them. And the thing about detail, uh, availability of detail and availability of raw data, those are, uh, the fact is, is that in the guidance, it was simply that these were general categories of reasons for rejecting papers and that independent science was brought into question because of the, uh, there was lack of detail, lack of access to raw data. And our argument is that, in fact, a properly peer-reviewed paper will provide the detail required, and that raw data is something that the scientist is expected to make available if questions arise, and that's generally the case. Now, your thing about the, um, the, the idea, the proposed solution of having, and we feel this is a very useful approach to be taken. It is innovative, but it's something that can contribute significantly to the future stability, security of, of the whole a chemical review process, GMO review process, all of these, is to have the industry finances be put into an impartial government body that then contracts with independent scientists to do this work. If this is done properly, the issues that you raised would not be a problem. If this is done in a transparent way, where the scientific, where the scientists who are doing this research um, are competitive in the way that they research, that they are brought into this process, and also where in, if it's done in a way that in, a sen in essence blinds them as, as to what industry organization uh, they're being, uh, the, whose chemical is it that they're testing. If these things are done properly, you're then in a position to really um, prevent these conflicts of interest from being developed. Now, you seem to muddy the water between assessment laboratory work and development laboratory work. Yes, the industry will continue to develop new pesticides and new uh, pharmaceuticals and new GMOs and all of these things. Yes, that they do. But independent scientists need to be the ones who assess the safety of those chemicals. And this idea of having the funding go into a government agency, and then that agency contracts with independent scientists to do that, is the logical way to do. And if it's done in a transparent way, the issues that you raise will, be, will not be an issue. Thank you. Madame Robinson. Um, I would just like to uh, add, this is a question really to um, the gentleman from the crop protection industry, whose name I also didn't catch. Um, I would be interested, and this is a genuine interested question, I don't know the answer to this question, um, whether there is one substance, chemical, that's been approved um, where the 
acceptable daily intake level, which is the heart of any risk assessment, has been based on an independent scientific study rather than an industry study. Um, so far, I haven't been able to find any, but it may be that I'm just not looking in the right place. Um, as far as I can see, every single chemical, uh, the acceptable daily intake is based on industry studies, not independent studies. Thank you. Um, on the uh, acceptable daily intake, I, I have to say I, I don't have that information to, to hand. I, I don't know. But I, what I can tell you, I, I, there is an example of a compound that has been uh, taken off the market uh, in Europe in, in recent years because of independent science uh, data that has been available. So it's not a setting the end point that has been done because of independent science. It's actually the final, the, the decision to take a product off the market or take, take a substance off the market has been based on the availability of, uh, of, uh, of, independent, uh, of independent science. And I think, can I just, can I just add one point? Um, linked to, to what you said uh, Claire, earlier on. Sorry, I should clarify. My name is Eros, that's spelled Euros, as in the money, with an S at the end. And the family name is Jones, which I guess is a little bit easier for, for most people. So it's Eros Jones. Um, on the revision of GLP, I think that's a very valid, uh, a valid point to, to make. I think, I think if we're going to have this discussion, about the validity of science, about the independence of science. I really think that's where the discussion should be, uh, should be taking place. Um, I don't think we have any problem with redesigning, revising the GLP system. I think we just need to be doing that in an open, transparent way, in an open forum, and globally and not at an European level. Let's keep GLP under review. It's not, it's not perfect. I don't think anybody would claim that it's, uh, it's perfect however you want to design, uh, sorry, ho however you want to define uh, perfect. I think we should always keep GLP uh, under review and we should all have an opportunity uh, to input into how GLP evolves over the, uh, over the coming years. And I just want to make one slightly different point. I think it's I think we're getting to the stage now with this discussion of EFSA independence, where it's getting, it's getting to be a, a very unconstructive game of uh, of table tennis, where we're just batting, uh, batting the ball over the uh, over the table. Actually, we're not batting the balls anymore, and I think this is the real unfortunate unfortunate part. We're batting individuals who are, who are being used as the ball. Can we please move on from that? Mr. Bergman, to come back on this, if you can take the question put by the gentleman and maybe comment on that last matter. And if I can just end the questions to you with two matters. First of all, coming back on Mrs. McGlade's very important point, which is uh, the burden of proof. It's very rare that you find this because people aren't trying to find it, so it's very hard to find, meaning that the way rules are set up does have a lot of, fe uh, of effect in applying good practice according to OECD, the way that results have been disposed of that were negative based on principles that are very scientifically debatable. For instance, it, if you have different evolution in male and female, for instance rat, and th that you get a constant average ending at nothing, then this is disposed of because you're taking the median, if you like, the, the plus versus the minus, and you end up with nothing. That's just one example. 
But this is problematic to me, and it's very much along Mrs. McLeod's point. What's the objective? The objective is to make sure that public health and general interest are borne in mind, and then to put a, a product on the market. And the burden of proof comes in there. Now you are saying this is sterile, but it's not. But, but it, it does allow you to make some progress by seeing how uncertainty operates and who's getting the benefit of that uncertainty. With a large margin of uncertainty, who's coming best off from that and where, which often happens with new technologies you've no insurance and there's the risk of development as well so these seem to be different things but they're roughly the same who's taking the risk against who and who is accepting the risk from the way things are operating at the moment it seems that a, a collective group takes on the risk and that's it and I don't see the logic in that anyway that's an extra point for you um, my name is Paul Leonard I work for BASF um, I'd like to at least share some perception from an industrial scientist to scientific perspective um, and Mrs Lepage thank you for the invitation to come here and I was very pleased that your opening comments uh, indicated the need for dialogue with industry and I really think that is important. Um, I would like to respond to the notion, if you like, or the suggestion that somehow industrial science is bad and public science, uh, in independent science is good. I've uh, worked in the crop protection industry for 28 years. Um, I've never ever come across a scientist in the crop protection industry, in my experience, who has in any way been uh, lent on or imposed upon to do anything other than report the data as they find it, first of all. Secondly, I feel very uh, privileged and pleased uh, to have worked with many public sector scientists um, and I have huge and equal respect for those scientists. I've worked with scientists in contract research laboratories and the one thing they all have in common is that they're scientists, they're proud of their trade, they're proud of their training. Uh, I am not aware of, I have no personal experience of anything other than honestly reporting the data and drawing conclusions. And I think we have to be very careful that we don't polarize this debate into good and bad. If there are legitimate questions, let's get around the table and talk about them. Mr. Beckman, and then we'll take some more questions. Thank you much. Um, so I would be happy to respond to the question. Um, Weinerman, thank you for your question. Um, you asked regarding if there were ever uh, studies which were long enough, um, if they were considered. Uh, the, the truth is, of course, that we are not excluding non-GLP studies. That, that's, that's for sure. What the panel is doing is to assess the the picture that's painted by all the, the studies that they have, GLP, non-GLP, bad or good GLP studies, bad or good non-GLP studies. They, ha they, have the, they have to, to as, as uh, Madame Lepage uh, touched upon, they, they have to, to assess the burden of proof here. Well, what, what, where is the proof here? Uh, what, what is the truth? And, and I think that the, the bisphenol A story, the last 10 years, it shows this quite clearly, um, where um, the, the science is simply not there clear enough for the EFSA panel to say clearly that, to conclude that this, 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 is, this is not dangerous. Th sorry, this, this is dangerous. This, this should be stopped. However, if you read the, the last opinion, there is uncertainty in the text. It is saying that it's not, it's not as clear as it was before. And sure enough, the Commission later for, forbid certain uses. And that's the role of the Commission 
and, and, and the role of EFSA to, to assess the science and indicate when there is uncertainty. Even though we might not be able to give the clear answer that the risk managers would like to have, at least we can express the uncertainty. Not taking any um, sort of um, credit for the decision of the Commission, this is purely the risk manager's uh, decision to take. Um, now, regarding the, the, the long, the, the other types of studies, uh, I mean, I, I was really intrigued by, by Professor Belpoggi's uh, description. Um, uh, you are running two parallel lines of work. It's, I think, probably unique, uh, really commendable. Thank you for sharing this. Um, and, but GLP studies, as you know, are not a uniform set of protocols. There are lots of different protocols available. Um, and, and there are lots of different ways of doing experiments which are not GLP, certainly, as you, you probably know. So my, the, the, the only thing I can say is that the, the, the panels which are selected to sit on our, sorry, the experts who are selected to sit on our panel, they are assessing the body of evidence as they see it. Um, and uh, if convinced, no matter where the science comes from, they will be influenced. I know they have assessed your studies several times. Um, regarding, um, if I may uh, comment also on if EFSA ever invites critical uh, scientists, and, and, and I can assure you that we do. Um, not, not every time someone criticizes us, certainly not, but, but for example, when working with the, the antibiotic resistance marker genes, we invited a, a professor from the Pasteur Institute uh, who had very different views from the, 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 the working group. We found it useful to, to, to listen to him. So we, we invited him as a hearing expert to our working group for a day, and he had free time to speak. And, our panel was, or working group was listening. Um, the same thing for uh, the, the re-evaluation of MUN863, the genetically modified maize. We invited a, a, a um, professor from France um, who was given the possibility to dis discuss with our, our working group, as well as actually large parts of the GMO panel at, at that point. Um, yearly we have meetings with uh, non-governmental environmental organizations. Um, it's a tradition now. I think we've had it five. In the end of this year, we, we will have the fifth meeting. Um, and we also, of course, have workshops on independence, on the comparators, on gen genetically modified organisms. Some of them are webcast, um, and they are preserved on our, web, on our web page so that it's possible to review them afterwards. We are working towards what you just asked for, actually, uh, to not work in a glass tower, but to be open. Um, in a European context. Re regarding the guidance document development, um, I, I, I take the point that, that there might be a view on who should develop these. I uh, just wanted to say that this is not done in isolation. We, we work have a working group, we have a panel, uh, a public global consultation on our documents. Um, often we have a webcast, sorry, not often, as often as we can afford, we have a webcast meeting with those who commented on, on the guidance document, we are now taking as a rule to discuss the, the document before adoption in the scientific committee of EFSA to get fresh eyes on the document. Uh, we are considering how to open up some parts of this process to the public. Uh, and then, of course, there's a publication, and we always, of course, update our guidance documents when needed. Madam Maglid. Thank you. Um, I must apologize, actually, I need to leave as well, so I'll be very brief. I think for us, sitting on, so to speak, the, the potentially the other side, downstream of the food and, and the feed, um, we have, we come up problems of the same um, substances from a completely different point of view, because in a sense, we tend to have to come with a belief that it's worth looking at false positives because in the end, the cost to society, were you wrong, would be very, very large. And so, in a sense, what we would be looking for, I think if there was a parliamentary response in any way, is that there's room for, a, for the false positives to be sat on the table, as well as the, there is no evidence of harm, 
we have, I think, today, because of this background of long, low dose, long exposures to the population at large, to start to consider that the false positives are worthy of consideration. Now, we have done analyses on this against a whole raft of both heavy metals, nicotinoids, and others in the environment. And every time we have come back with the answer that actually what should provoke the precautionary principle, what should provoke the discussion, is in fact being alerted to the fact that whether this is a false positive or not, the calculations of the cost of society need to be taken into account. So I'm actually putting on the table that there's an additional layer that sits alongside what EFSA does in the kind of short to medium term, that there should be an, an additional set of evidence put on the table. And whether it comes from independent science, whether it comes from research community, whether it comes from industry, these for me are all admissible evidence or forms of evidence that need to be countenanced. And I just finish with one thing. I think that precisely the point you made about there is good and bad research everywhere. One of the crucial things that we looked at through all the evidence that we've looked at over the years is what was the question that the researchers asked before they actually put pen to paper and did the experiments or did the research. And actually that experimental kind of process set out by the question, I have to say almost in every case, ended up with a particular answer that could have been predicated if you just read the question at the beginning. And so again, I come back and say there are some perils here, even in the best of science, that we're not quite as heuristic as we would like to think. So having an independent body is incredibly important, and whether it, you consider it to be good enough, or EFSA, or a, the EA, whatever, the need for Europe to have an independent body that looks upstream of the research, as well as downstream at the answers, and balances out all of the evidence with all the vested interests put on the table, including science, that as I said, there are huge vested interests in paradigms, whether we like it or not. And uh, I think the mobile industry is very, very clear on that one. Thousands of studies about the heat effects, only one study on carcinogens, and now we have the building up of an evidence after latency that, in fact, we should have been looking at those sorts of studies. So, you know, I think thousands versus one doesn't necessarily give you the answer. So asking that question at the beginning, the Ramatsini approach, I think, is excellent. And perhaps the Parliament could think about an additional layer of security assurance as to who bears the costs if we were to get it wrong could be worthy of, of a, a further debate. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur. Thank you. There are three questioners still to come. Can I take them in order? And then I think we'll have to wind up. Uh, my name is Hans Mataar. Um, I'm an independent regulatory advisor. Uh, but although, since I advise mostly industry, I guess uh, my independency is uh, similar to that of independent research. Um, a comment uh, on what Claire Robinson said about ADI's acceptable daily intake figures um, that exclusively come from industry data. Uh, I think that uh, one should bear in mind that there's also a lot of industry data that never even reaches the eyes of evaluators or, uh, or, or, or the authorities. And that's all the data that is developed, that's generated for substances that never reach the market. And those data is developed by the same scientists in the same laboratories, reported in the GLP to the management who then decides that no, this substance does not meet the requirements, and that's the end of the development. And what I mean to say with that is, that data is exactly the same data for substances that do meet the requirements, that is ultimately used for setting, uh, for setting ADIs or other reference values. So in terms of trustworthiness, there is no, there is no difference there. Uh, in industry, uh, industry doesn't keep anything in the dark, I was going to say, uh, with, the, with such data. Uh, they are all developed under the same GLP and reported. There are more substances that on the basis of such data do not make it to the market, simply because they do not meet the requirements, than the few substances that come through the process, the, the filtering process of the industry themselves. Alors, euh, qui avait une... Who else wanted to come in? Yes, madam. Uh, the lady opposite. Thank you very much. Um, 
I would like to comment on the uh, example given by Mr. Bergmans uh, on how independent experts get invited to, to EFSA panels. And I think the example of antibiotic resistance market genes is really the best example that shows how EFSA is violating its own core values of transparency and scientific excellence. Because in 2004, um, the GMO panel basically literally copy and pasted uh, uh, a report, a paper by Entrans Food, which is an EU-funded research consortium with involvement of all kinds of companies, saying that the antibiotics in question, uh, like cannabisin, were not of uh, uh, were of minor value for uh, human medicine, which was then uh, heavily contested by the World Health Organization, for example. In 2009, again, the EFSA considered that the presence of this antibiotic uh, resistance market gene is not a problem in GMOs, like the Amflora potato. And then the EU uh, approved the Amflora potato, and now it's being cultivated. Uh, whereas it ex uh, EFSA itself has acknowledged that actually cannabisin uh, is uh, uh, an antibiotic of critical importance. Uh, I will leave some, some summaries of the report we've, uh, we've published yesterday uh, on this story and how BASEF has been lobbying the Commission and putting pressure, etc., uh, uh, on the table. Madame? I'm Mara van Dijk. I'm an independent researcher, recently fired for publicly defending an anti-OGM uh, action from uh, KU Leuven. I have a question for Mr. Bergman. Um, I was wondering, after uh, the presentation you gave and also the discussion that we had, a lot was focused on policy, on how things should be, but actually re uh, little has been said about how things are actually uh, done about practice. Um, so I was wondering like how uh, EFSA in practice is guaranteeing that the public interest is defended and how the focus, like the extreme focus on this uh, policy of declaration of interest is uh, helping for that. My name is Tony Tweedale. I also consult with two NGOs, and my interests align with NGOs. On the question of reliability of science, what is reliable, what isn't? There's one aspect that hasn't been mentioned at all, and I want to just bring it up for future discussion. Uh, these OECD uh, protocols and all classic toxicology methods test very high doses of, of agents, and there's good scientific reasons to do that to find toxic effect, it's, it's, it's easier to do that. But the reality is that we, as a society, simply do not, almost never test uh, realistic d doses, and there's also good scientific uh, reason to think that these doses might have effects. There's lots of literature on that. So uh, this is <clears throat> part of why agencies and industry call uh, OECD protocols reliable. They start with poisonous doses and work their way down gradually to chronic exposure doses, and they do it stepwise, and so they have more confidence that when they see a dose response relationship, more of the chemical causes more of a disease, that that's a causative effect. Uh, all well and good, but we're proving chemicals uh, that have never, ever been tested at at realistic doses in the regulatory test. So this is why the data that uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Teresa Belpoggi presented, that her laboratory does, you, we really have to start, as a society, have to start considering the, the factors uh, that they are testing for that make their tests more realistic. Depending on the agent, they increase the size of the animal groups that are tested to be able to reliably detect a smaller but significant effect that comes from a lower dose, and probably even more importantly, the factors that she already mentioned. Uh, they d dose during the development of the animal, and they don't kill the animal at the end of the uh, testing period, but they wait to see what diseases develop in old age. And finally, what's the the net effect of, of having this kind of 
testing regime. For the category of risk assessments that uh, consists pre-market approval, uh, you're doing a risk assessment for the purpose of allowing or not a chemical onto the market. I am still waiting to hear of the first uh, risk assessment that has uh, used an independent uh, study for its key chronic toxicity uh, study, which is what sets the ADI. I'm still waiting to hear of a single risk assessment that exists in the last four decades since GLP was instituted that did not use an industry-funded study for these pre-market uh, pre marketing risk assessments. I think uh, we have to conclude because we have just five minutes. But uh, just to clarify, this is not an event pro or anti-industry. We gave actually also hard time to Mr. Bergman, but the truth is that the parliamentarians are relying very much on the expertise of EFSA and EMA as well, because between ourselves we have tough conversations and we need a referee with expertise to help us to solve these tough discussions. We are just very sensitive. For all of you to know, we are very sensitive because sometimes not very clean techniques of lobbying are used in this house. There have been a couple of scandals. Some of them have been public because of MEPs being paid for some amendments, and you already probably knew, know uh, about these scandals. All the time when we have an important uh, resolution or legislation, the parliament is full of lobbyists, and there is a great pressure. And there is a tendency in the House, when there is a dispute between public interest, environment, public health, etc., and industry interests, always somehow the winner is the industry. That's why parliamentarians are very sensitive. And we are creating these kind of uh, uh, seminars and uh, activities just to try to find a balance and good communication and to take the opinion of all stakeholders. Because sometimes we come to very weird, actually, arguments which are presented in the House and in the plenary. For example, there was an attempt to deny the medical impact on the human body of sugar, salt, and fat when we discuss the food information uh, and the food labeling. I'm a medical doctor in 21st century, listening to colleagues saying that it's not, and also to industry representatives, in, in, in representatives including the Association of European Association of Food Industry, saying that it's not sugar salt, um, sugar, salt, and fat, but it's physical activity that matters to human health. It's pretty weird, and it's pretty, uh, how say, health illiteracy is, is a sign of health illiteracy. Then there was an attempt to withdraw from the resolution on tobacco and anti-tobacco policy the issue of tobacco, sub, uh, tobacco uh, agriculture and subsidies because there were still some MEPs which were referring of non-harmful effect of tobacco on human health. Still in the house in 21st century after all this evidence that has been discussed and owned. So you mentioned uh, WHO and uh, um, antimicrobial resistance. In this house, we did not, we were not actually able to provide all the studies that are bringing evidence that the, uh, that the antimicrobial products or antibiotics used for animals are actually going through the food to the human body and they matter to the human health and to the antimicrobial resistance in human beings. So this amendment actually falls down because of lobbying. So there is nobody in the scientific world who will dispute this fact. There, are a lot, there is a lot of research, there is WHO report on this, but still in the House, the other argument has the prevalence. And uh, there are many other examples. That's why we are really sensitive. But there are many cases in which actually EFSA was extremely helpful. And probably the cases in which EFSA is taking the right decision 
in terms of protecting public interest and public health are dominating the minor number of failures that are actually spoiling the trust sometimes. EFSA was behaving extremely, uh, how to say, uh, defending, and it was extremely uh, good in defending public interest when there was a proposal for health claim that salt is very good in the food for, the, for human health and for the, for the bones. Might be good for the bones, but it's probably very bad for the cardiovascular diseases or for your heart. Anyway, such a claim and many other claims as such have been actually put down. And this is because of the experts of EFSA. So we should not go throw the baby with the bath, but uh, we have to be somehow balanced. And that's why our proposal as MEPs is to continue this dialogue and to have mutual trust and common dialogue in the future as well. And we will put all uh, thoughts and views from today into recommendation. We will sign a letter together and we will send it to EFSA. And also, uh, with, I think that it's good to demand uh, an action plan and a roadmap and to see how actually we could help EFSA to reform and to, uh, to gain more trust than uh, just to, to uh, respond to some uh, accusations. So I think this is the best and positive way to continue working in the future. And uh, uh, I think that the industry, what I heard actually with the meetings with the European Association of, uh, uh, for example, the food industry, is much advanced from what parliamentarians are thinking they should defend as position of industry. The industry is the one that is actually putting lots of money into research and trying to put on the market the best product to be competitive. So this trust needs to be developed and this trust needs to be supported. So these activities need to be supported. That's why I mentioned Horizon 2020 and the extreme role of public funding into uh, independent research. But this could happen hand to hand between all stakeholders, not in contradiction. And this is our call and this is the aim actually of our seminar. So thank you very much for being tolerant and also for taking all the challenges that we put forward and uh, all the people that uh, actually uh, in a more quiet or more emotional way have expressed their uh, views. Thank you once again. Just a to conclude briefly, uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you to those who organised the meeting. Mrs. Lepage kindly thanks the interpreters as well. I fully concur with what Antonia Parvanova just said. It goes without saying. But I would just like to underscore a point. We're not anti or pro anything. That's not the issue. What matters to us is to defend as far as possible the interests of European citizens and their manifold. Of course, there's health. Of course, there's economic uh, and jobs, uh, economic interests and jobs as well. All of this matters. It's also the interests of public finances in all member states and Europe in general. Everything has to be put together in the equation. And if we don't have studies that are as diverse as possible, enabling us to try to weigh things up, to factor everything in, to avert a health risk that will be disastrous for people and for our public finances, that means that we have to be demanding, demanding in terms of the information that comes into us. And that's why it's so important for us to be able to trust entirely the assessments that are given to us, the data underpinning these assessments. In other words, we need to think again about confidentiality because that's critical. Confidential data is something we've discussed a lot today, but clearly that's a big issue. The, the problem of uh, low indices, that these are all issues that matter, matter, that matter in terms of legislation, but often it's not legislation, but the implementation of legislation that's the problem. So we've got a clear goal, 
And so thank you very much for your input today. I think it was a very interesting, very rich, uh, fruitful discussion.